hear me? Not sure we can hear you, Dave. You you seem to be have a dead microphone, Dave. Nope. Okay. No audio. Negative copy. Just a tiny bit of audio, like it's way down. Hearing some kind of might be mouse clicks, but no voice. Zoom. Uh, yes. I think it's worth waiting a, another minute or so for Dave. Usually has it working. Somebody's typing away that we're hearing. It's not Dave. Oh, I can sympathize. I sure have enough trouble getting it running here. Hello. There. Hello. Hello. Yep. Hi, Dave. You're hearing something. Well, I I'm trying. Can you hear me? Barely. Yeah, it's not your mouth, Mike, but we're hearing you. Oh, let's see what I'm on. Hello. Hello. Oh, yeah, usually on, sound much better. You're on the uh, USB microphone, maybe. Mine, mine grabs that sometimes when I'm on the mic, too. Or, or the one on the computer, or in the computer. I found understanding the audio flow through a Windows computer to be an exercise in frustration. Thank you, what? Microsoft. Yeah, I was going to say, what on a Windows computer is not an exercise in frustration, Jim? <laughs> Good point, Gary. Good point. <laughs> I don't know. I suspect uh, Dave's using uh, Linux, though. I'm using Linux. We're hearing you now. A uh, little there, there. Yeah, I, I'm running Linux. And when I come on, sometimes it, it doesn't work and go up to settings and down to sound. And then it, there's a zoom engine. And for some reason, it slid the slider way over to the left. And I got to pump that back up. Well, what happened? Uh, I was on a different machine, my usual machine, and it locked up just as this, everything started. So I switched to another running machine. And so here I am. <laughs> oh, oh, come on. Computers never do that. No, yeah, right. no. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> where are we in the list? Waiting for We're you. waiting for you. Okay. Well, uh, this week, uh, I've been kind of busy with other stuff. I haven't, I did a little bit of programming, but, um, and I did have been reading the mail. Uh, some interesting stuff coming up and actually some interesting talks on the GNU radio uh, conference, which is right after DCC. Um, there's some talks on using uh, GPUs to speed up uh, GNU radio, which is, sounds very interesting to me. Anyway, uh, next on the list is Nathaniel uh, W2NAF. Go ahead, Nathaniel. Uh, thanks a lot, Steve. Uh, so this week I have been um, working on uh, finishing getting the 
talk list ready to go for Tapper DCC. So I got that sent in. Um, so I'm waiting to hear back from Steve Bible uh, to see what the final list is going to be. And um, I've been doing some personal work on my shack. Finally got a uh, two meter 440 base station antenna installed and uh, just doing some other things, getting ready for the beginning of the school year, including looking at more RBN whisper net data. So W2NF back to net. Fine business. Next on the list is Bill in eight ET. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I finally did something this week. So I feel like it <laughs> being useful. I got the, the great receiver built and uh, took it over and had a technician look at it who had younger eyes than I do and also a magnifier. And he touched up a couple of solder joints. Now I, I haven't dared put 12 volts to it. And uh, so that's my next step. And I've got to figure out how much RF to put in the local oscillator spigot. I've got a Hewlett Packard uh, signal generator downstairs that I'll use just to test it, but I need to figure out how much RF to feed into it before I, I put the smoke to it. And uh, so that's the, the high point in the, the work for uh, this group. And uh, other things today, I got uh, somebody finally to climb one of our towers. He's first time climber. He went up and uh, Finally got up 30 feet to where he could work on the rotor. I had, all I've got left to do is attach the cable to the rotor. And the, the screws and lugs on the bottom of the rotor rusted so bad he couldn't under, unscrew any of them. So he came back down and now I guess we've got to tip the tower over and work on it on the ground, but uh, getting closer. So that's it from here. Well, that sounds like a busy week. And next on the list is Jim K4BSE. Go ahead, Jim. Well, not a whole lot on this project. Uh, Bill, on the uh, LO to put in, I would start at around uh, zero to about plus three or four dBm in and uh, see where you need to go from there. That's what I did anyway. And uh, I didn't, didn't smoke anything. Uh, let's see, on this project, uh, other than continuing to take data, really haven't uh, done a whole lot. I've got a few little things in the inbox uh, where they've been stuck for some time that I want to do on instructions, but um, right now I'm kind of in a holding pattern. Back to net. Well, fine business. And next on the list is Bill, AB4EJ. Have you already given your talk? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, we were talking about a little bit. Um, I've been working on the magnetometer stuff. I uh, played a little bit around with uh, the the, the 3D print on the, uh, the a little frame for holding the magnetometer, but that that's just that's just today. Prior to that, I've been working on doing some more comparisons of what the two magnetometers are giving me, and what the two magnetometers give me is very comparable if you plot them separately. But if you try and plot them both, uh, the, there's something that that Matplotlib doesn't like about the combined files. I think this is something that David Waugh mentioned something about uh, uh, via email that the, the different devices skip uh, a second here and there. And the two different devices skip seconds, different seconds, of course. And when Matplotlib tries to put together the same plot, it goes haywire. At least that's what I think is happening. Anyway, so. The way I have to get around it is just compare the show the two plots independently plotted and then they look fine. When you try and plot them together in the same plot, it, it just it looks weird. It, it cuts off the last couple hours of one of them. Anyway, so uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I completed my, uh, my talk for DCC, uh, uh, but they don't know, they can't tell me where to put the presentation. They don't have that set up yet, apparently. So, but anyway, I'm, I jumped on that real fast because I've got some vacation coming up and I want to get it all done before that. So, um, I've also, I prepared the presentation uh, for the magnet or align, magnet, magnetometer alignment technique using the local host. Um, I have not recorded it yet, but I did go through and rehearse it to get a time on it. It comes out around nine minutes, so it's a little bit shorter than, but that, uh, I think that's probably okay. So anyway, back to net. Well, Bill, I can give you a little feedback. We're 
probably going to use a Dropbox and it'll probably be asking for them the first week of September. Okay. So Good you deal. Can wait, wait a little bit. Um, next on the list is Dan in for XWE. Go ahead, Dan. Well, thanks, Dave, and good evening, everyone. Well, last week was taken up for the most part uh, with Raspberry Pis, the new Radio 3.9, Python, more specifically PIP, and um, kind of reinstalling or installing Python 3.9.2 on the Raspberry Pi. It's uh, been a rather interesting week. Anyway, back to you, Dave. Okay. Uh, next on the list, we have Dave McGaw, N1HAC. Go ahead. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, playing with various radios uh, professionally and otherwise. Um, I'll do a quick uh, aside on the magnetometers. I know David Waz has been asking questions about sampling of magnetometers. And for some reason, my experience is that everyone wants to sub, sub Nyquist sample them. So, you know, you got a 30 Hertz bandwidth uh, magnetometer being sampled once a second. Um, almost never are they properly filtered. Um, we may want to consider doing that or just go with the flow. Um, my one uh, major, what I will say my major uh, accomplishment this week radio wise was we had a local uh, Aries net yesterday uh, due to the hurricane that did and did not hit us. Um, in fact, I wanted to ask Nathaniel about how it went, fared for him because we got absolutely nothing until a little bit of rain this afternoon. But I know that Scranton got hit pretty hard. Um, but uh, we had a, a 75 meter net and I don't have a 75 meter antenna. So I took my 40 meter loop and worked it against uh, my ground rod and damned if it didn't work. So that was my major accomplishment <laughs> for the week. Back to that. Well, congratulations. Uh, next on the list is Dave Witten, KD0EAG. Go ahead, Dave. Hello, I'm just continuing to work on uh, software, especially the uh, multi-mag program that I have always intended to replace the run mag program um, that hopefully will have better um, deadline timing. Uh, the run mag was never intended to be anything but an, a, you know, a, an experimental tool. Uh, but it's kind of gotten pressed into service. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm working on that and uh, cleaning the code and such like. And that's it. Okay. Uh, next on the list is David Waugh, uh, KE8QPE. Go ahead, David. Uh, well, uh, hello, everyone. I, I, um, I, I finally got the magnetometer or the or the chip replaced and that solved the uh, cattywampus uh, y-axis issue i was having so it was in fact uh, damaged by and i talked to uh, pmi about this and i said i was messing with the wires and it stopped working and they asked me what messing with the wires meant <laughs> and, I, and i i think i said this before i i mean that's sort of universal code for i know i did something i'm not sure what it was <laughs> uh, but but at any rate so that that has fixed things uh mostly I, I also moved the magnetometer location um and and that may have some plus and minuses uh but it, it'll take a i'll have to look at the data more to try to quantify or at least qualify what's going on there uh but bill with, with the plotting the data or, or bill uh, uh ab4ej um if are you doing it as an xy plot or as a line plot because if you do it as an xy plot um where that it doesn't matter it, everything will match up but if it's just a line plot then you run into issues with the timing 
uh, but um, you know, Jules can probably address that more. And it sounds like there's some fixes in the works, and it, there are also some other parameters you can run to sort of get things closer to one second. But maybe that's a, a topic for. Uh, Later, but uh, back to uh, Dave. Or... Uh, I don't know how important this is, really, Dave. I uh, uh, appreciate the the the, the words. Um, I was just going to show a comparison plot as part of the uh, when I'm talking about the alignment and and whatnot. And it, uh, but I had not tried anything other than a line plot. But I will go back and yes. take a look at that and see. Well, and I think it's fine for the presentation. I mean, this may be something going forward, not something that you have to do retroactively. Okay. So okay, thanks. Um, next, well, I did want to mention there, uh, this gets into stuff that I used to work on. Um, <clears throat> line plots are time series plots and they're considered to be equally spaced uh, measurements. And it does not correct for the value on, in the uh, X, but uh, a scatter plot will put the dot at an X and a Y location. So that may fix some of the issues that you're seeing. And particularly we're, we're finding holes in the, David's finding holes in the sequence in a day. Um, and, and it might be good to clean that up with that kind of plotting. Anyway, on down the list. Next would be Gary, uh, AF8A. Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, hey, good evening, everyone. Um, mostly what I've got is a, is a DCC question that maybe somebody could answer along the way is that uh, I got what I thought was my link today from Bruce for the registration, but it seemed kind of odd saying that he was creating a Zoom account for me and I needed to click a button and do such and such. Um, I got the same thing. I thought it was a little threatening, almost. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I'm not the only one. So I'm just gonna sit tight because I can't imagine why you need to create an account for me as just a, as, a, as a listener. I'm not presenting or anything, but anyhow, that's it, back to that. Okay. I don't think mine was just creating account. I think it said something about taking over my account. Oh, <laughs> well. And it did, but well, I don't well, know. Seems we'll figure work. out what's going on, Scotty and I, later. Um, let's see. Um, next on the list is Hyoman, uh, KD2MCR. Oh, hello, Hyoman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I do not have much to report uh, since the upload of the, the manual. Uh, I don't know if you guys have looked at it or not, uh, but uh, I would encourage people to take a look at it to see if there's anything to add or remove or fix. So that's all I can say. Back to that. Thank you. Fine business. And next on the list is James, KG4DSG. Go ahead, James. Uh, good evening, Dave and the group. Uh, nothing to report here, just listening in. I'll just turn it back to the net. Well, fine business. And next on the list is Joe, uh, W7LUX. Sounds like you've been doing lots of uh, events. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the people mentioned uh, feeding an antenna against, against ground. Years and years and years ago, I decided to enter the 160 meter contest. And I don't have a 160 antenna, but I do have a big. Uh, Full um, half wave um, uh, 80 meter fed with ladder line. And I just fed the uh, ends of the ladder line against ground and with five watts worked from uh, Hawaii to Maine. So I was kind of happy about that. And all I could think of was, boy, there must be some people on the other end who have very, very good ears. <laughs> okay, um, great receiver. First of all, I've been working with Steve on uh, sending uh, pulses and, and whatever's back and forth and trying to figure out what the delays are in the radios and stuff like that. And um, uh, I had occasion to uh, just go ahead and use the grape receiver because it has essentially no delay. It's on the order of, I don't know, maybe 100 uh, 
uh, nanoseconds or so. It's very, very fast. And I was using that. And what I did is I uh, just cranked the, uh, oh, I was using this on 20 meters, which it's not normally known for uh, working on. But uh, I went ahead and cranked the, uh, uh, the signal generator up to 3.3 volts peak to peak as per the uh, schematic. And that worked uh, really, really well. But we're having a lot of trouble determining the delay through the transmitter, how the uh, digital signal processing stuff is uh, delaying the, the uh, pulses for uh, doing time of flight experiments and so forth. And uh, all I can say is uh, it's a problem and I'm seriously considering uh, digging uh, an old uh, analog radio out of the, uh, uh, the closet and setting that up and trying to use that instead of uh, a uh, more modern radio with uh, digital signal processing. It's just, uh, it's a bear getting through. And to give you an idea of what we're seeing is uh, Steve wanted me to send him a pulse. So I can send him a pulse of sine or, or just a square wave or whatever. And if you look very carefully at the waveform, you can see where the digital signal processor is anticipating the pulse. And there's little squiggles in the, uh, uh, the waveform just before the main pulse is transmitted. And so this is, this is really throwing a monkey wrench into our uh, determining time of flight and getting a good accurate calibration on the, uh, uh, the transmitted uh, signal. And that's what I've been doing in addition to all the public service events. Back to you, Dave. Thank you. Fine, fine business. And next on the list would be Jonathan, KC3EEY. Go ahead, Jonathan. Hi, hi everybody. Um, I, I had uh, uh, quite a busy week. I was um, uh, finally finishing up my Raspberry Pi box for my VLF receiving system. Um, and what I had to do was I, I uh, had to add, add some components to the um, uh, power and, and, and audio board. Um, I, I added, added the bleeder resistors. I added the gas discharge arresters. Um, and I um, added some wiring to uh, uh, ground it to the uh, aluminum case that I have everything in. Um, so. I ordered a uh, larger USB drive, and um, I also ordered some uh, cables that um, are a, a um, Ethernet cable that'll that'll make make everything fit better. Uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm I'm uh, trying to figure out a way to uh, get that um, audio injector isolated uh, sound card to. Um, uh, fit with, with everything in the box. And I think that I can do it. Um, and um, this way it'll, it could capture at 192 kilohertz. Um, also, um, there was uh, some, some really cool amateur activity uh, in the VLF band uh, recently, which I'll, I'll like to share. I posted the uh, link in the chat. Um, there have been some um, coherent VPSK transmissions done. Um, uh, uh, one at 2.97 kilohertz and the other at 1.67 kilohertz. And I was really excited about these transmissions because um, um, at 1.67 kilohertz is, is very close to the uh, um, uh, tweak resonance of 1.7 kilohertz of the Earth ionosphere waveguide. And I was just very excited to, to uh, uh, see what would happen with that signal. Um, and as you can see with the link, um, there it, um, a ham in Germany uh, posted some, some plots and some really cool findings. Um, he has a uh, triple axis system in uh, uh, east-west of north-south H field and a vertical E field receiving system. And you, you can see um, the, the um, wild amplitudes um, and, and um, uh, phase swings at 1.67 kilohertz. Uh, really, really cool stuff. 
um, because uh, it, it's definitely something that I expected. Um, and um, the um, um, this is basically um, uh, a, a, a paper in the making. Um, if I were to write a, a, a paper, this would be an excellent problem to uh, try to understand and uh, uh, see, 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 see if I can figure it out and, and uh, write a paper. So I'm excited um, um, for, for more transmissions uh, at the, at the uh, tweak resonance frequency. Um, that's all I have. Back to the net. Well, fine business. And next on the list is Jules, K2, KGJ. Jules, did you get much rain? Oh, who did we get rain? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> the last measure of the gauge was, uh, as of this evening, 2.7 2. Uh, 2. inches, uh, less than the five that we were potentially promised. We had, in fact, the uh, RARES uh, net was on standby until 8 p.m. this evening when the uh, when the Weather Bureau finally uh, released that. So, you know, did a lot of preparation, got the generators running, got the batteries charged, got everything going. Fortunately, we didn't have to use any of it because by the time the winds hit here, they had died down to, to basically zephyrs. But we did get a lot of rain. And I'm still waiting to see if I get seepage into the basement. That may take another day or so before that develops. Um, <clears throat> regarding the magnetometer this week, uh, Dave Walk and I spent a fair amount of time uh, emailing back and forth about observations, specifically regarding the subsampling that Dave McGowan mentioned a bit ago. It turns out that um, the, uh, the magnetometer, if you use the averaging function, and use a cycle count of 400 or more in the averaging function, you wind up getting a low pass filter function, by the way. But what I did, uh, because we were curious, we were seeing some potential 60 Hertz interference in what Dave was seeing. So I set up a solenoid source here, calibrated to a specific uh, field strength, and just to see whether I could uh, duplicate that on my magnetometer here, on a test magnetometer I have, uh, to see when I started to see some subharmonics of the uh, 60 hertz uh, signal and got some very interesting information. Uh, as long as you're sampling exactly on one second intervals, it's a constant level. There's no, uh, that's all you see basically. Um, found out that the, got a little more information out of uh, uh, PNI because uh, looking at the magnetometer uh, ASIC, and trying to determine how it worked internally, it had to be doing reciprocal counting. So it had to have a high frequency oscillator in order to measure the period of the uh, LR oscillations. And indeed it does, it has an internal uh, 50 megahertz crystal oscillator. And if you work through the math, you can see that that's how they can achieve the precision by, do precision by doing reciprocal counting. And there's measuring the period and then verse to get the frequency. And then your sensitivity is a, is a matter of the, uh, uh, differential frequencies between plus and minus bias runs on the uh, LR oscillators. At any rate, more information on that. Finally, understood a little more about the RM3100 this week. Other than that, um, I'll turn it back to Net. Um, and again, uh, thankful that we didn't get hit, really hit hard by the storm. Very good. And next on the list is Mike AA8K. Greetings to everyone listening. Okay, and next on the list is Scotty, W2DFI. Go ahead, Scotty. Oh, you get to see me after I take my secret shutter off. Um, anyway, I've uh, been a uh, pretty good week here. I've got the uh, the RF adapter or the RF module adapter board uh, the schematic completed. And so I sent that off to uh, Tom and John and uh, did just for a quick review to see if uh, it looks okay. Uh, also got the, um, the, uh, the loopback board done for the data, for the uh, RF module. And I'm almost done with the clock box. I got a couple connections still to get the loopback board done for that. And I just have the leaf module has to be done. And, uh, Hearing your microphone, Dave. 
sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, so I got those boards pretty much done. They still need to be reviewed. Then uh, I got uh, some interesting uh, info from John Ackerman uh, just today. He's got the um, carrier board for the uh, GPS done. And uh, I guess we'll wait till the uh, general session. But I got a, a picture of the board and he has done. He's sending it out here to have the final assembly done at RTM. And uh, then when that's done, I'll send them back to him and then he'll be able to, um, to actually set up the actual clock chain for our boards before we get the clock modules. So we, he'll be able to do some testing on the boards before he actually gets the clock module. So, and um, as far as the magnetometer goes, the, um, we're still, I still haven't heard back from the CM on him getting the PC boards in. I'm gonna have to touch base with them tomorrow. But uh, we do have the kit of parts. We just checked, double checked today. Uh, all of the SMT parts are in. Uh, I think we're, we've got pretty much all the kit of parts except for the PI boards, which were ordered uh, last week. So uh, have, we'll be waiting on those probably another day or two. But hopefully this week we'll uh, get those boards built and we'll be able to send those out and have people uh, have some fun with them. And, well, Scotty, one, one yeah. comment here on the boards. Um, the uh, PNI has the, uses the typical voltage of 3.0 volts for the RM3100. We're running at 3.3, which is within their operational range. I was curious to see if there was any difference between those two voltages in terms of function. And I ran tests this week on both the 3.0 and 3.2, and there's a 3.3 rather than a zero difference. So our 3.3 is fine. Uh, the only reason we ever we might ever want to change that is if we wanted for some reason to extend the length of the cable to give us a little more voltage drop uh, tolerance to the LDO regulator coming in. Uh, somebody could change it if they needed to to 3.0 to get that. But in terms of function, they're just, they're identical. And the problem with going to 3.0 on the regulator is then the uh, other parts on the board will also be at 3.0, and then you will you could end up exceeding the voltage on those parts. I think we looked at this once before about just changing the regulator to 3.0. And there's some other issues, so I'm glad to hear that it works great. Well, actually, I, I did tr I've tried the other parts on the board, including the 9808 and the 9616 uh, extender, and they seem to work fine. But again, we don't need to do that. The 3.3 is, is, is perfect. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so that's good. So we'll, we'll stick there. And again, the, the regulator we're using is a 3.3, so... That's what the reason we're we were talking about going to 3.0 was to increase the uh, uh, range yeah, of that's, cable. Right, that, right. That's, you have that, more headroom yeah. on the regulator. Right, but I don't think we need it. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so we should have those back, and then uh, we'll see uh, the next uh, phase. Assuming uh, the boards check out with everyone, we'll uh, be looking at production uh, in the next month or two, which. Um, Maybe I'm being a little optimistic because I got to give everybody a chance to test the boards and make sure they work and play around with them in their pipe and make sure that Dave's brackets are going to work well. And, you know, he's got that all figured out. And I know it takes some time. People have other things to do too. So we'll see if we can get that done and uh, get production going. And then uh, we'll see uh, how many people are really interested when we open up the order page. And uh, <laughs> we're actually talking about... Uh, Nathaniel, we're talking about a run of 500 boards, which would be 250 sets. So that might be a little optimistic, but problem is you start cutting the number down and the cost starts going up. And uh, we've been trying to keep the cost of a set of boards under a hundred bucks. And uh, of course that doesn't include the cable or the pipe or the level or the bulkhead or any of that stuff, but at least it gets you, and or the Raspberry Pi, but at least it gets you the, the main components that you have to add. So. Um, anyway, I think that's it for this week. So back to you, Dave. Well, fine business. And that brings us to the end of the list. So uh, we're open for general discussion. I wanted to mention that uh, I saw the uh, article that Phil did in uh, QST. Not only did they get uh, the TAPR acronym wrong, they got it wrong twice, two different ways. I don't know if anyone noticed that. Yes, I think I did. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, you, know, you know, they did get it as Texas Academic Performance Reports, mm -hmm. which from his, uh, uh, the email that he sent, that I figured that was probably what they had done. But even in the 
in the um, in his uh, bio, it talks about the Tuscan amateur rate packet radio <laughs> organization. Yeah, you know we're in the we're the Tuscan amateur radio group. You know. Yeah. We're... Anyway, the, the, the thing that's really uh, infuriating about the whole thing is, is that Phil actually caught that mistake and and notified them of it, and they still did not get it corrected. Right. So that's really, really, it's like, what more could we have done? I mean, we pointed it out to them and, and they, they still didn't fix it. So, and we but, are affiliated with them. Yeah. And, and it's like, I think uh, Stana well, wrote uh, uh, to, to the QST editor, uh, uh, notifying them of the discrepancy or the error. And <laughs> she tried to be very uh, uh, diplomatic, but you could tell it was very upsetting. So she wrote, uh, this, this is unacceptable for the number one amateur radio magazine in the world. So it was like, <laughs> give, them a little, give them a little stroke, you know, but then say, by the way, you guys really messed up big time this time. <laughs> I did, um, I do have a corrected copy of the article from headquarters that I got permission to post on, to reprint, post on the Hamsa website. Mm. So you can, I just put the link in the chat if you want a corrected PDF that we are allowed to reprint, at least on the Hamside website, and we could probably get permission to reprint That's it good. elsewhere. You I can know, download thinking, it. I'm you can download it moving. from that link I just posted. I think I'm going to move to Tuscany, and then we can be called the Tuscan. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, the, uh, the, Isn't the that like Orlando a... Hamcation is going to happen. For a while, it was talked that we're going to cancel it, but it was announced at the uh, a, by the AWRL apparently yesterday, uh, day before yesterday at the Huntsville Ham Fest. It is going to. They're planning to have it, so, so maybe is, we could have a booth and and hand out corrected copies of the PDF of the article. <laughs> we we already are already signed up for a booth because we deferred it from last year to this year, so it's already paid for and everything. So that's great. So that's cool. good. So it, it is th th that came from. Hamcation that they're going to do it right, official word. That yeah, they there were there were printed flyers being handed out at the Huntsville Hamfest, uh, and it was all eight eight overall was there. They knew about it, so uh, and we 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 were we were shocked when we heard this because we were giving away tickets as as a uh, because you know for raffle prizes and what is that? We thought it was canceled. We went up and checked, and they they said it was on. Okay, good. Oh. Better make my plane reservations. It can always change again, I guess, but that, that's a, as of this weekend. Yeah. Wow, okay, good. That was always a fun time down there. And it, I, think I, I think I have more fun there than I have at Dayton because those guys take the uh, forums more seriously. There's just as many people come by to talk and I think because we haven't been there every year for the past umpteen years, they come by and go, oh, are you guys still around? You know, so it's <laughs> it's a, important to get our face out there. And, but handing yeah, out the corrected ones would be a good idea. Dust off and press your uh, ham side lab coat. Yeah. So should we get a <laughs> banner printed up with, with the uh, Texas uh, administrator, whatever, whatever <laughs> that thing is? <laughs> Maybe they can have a booth next to ours. Yeah, we can put a big banner up. We'd have like a circle and a bar through it or something like that. You know? <laughs> we could serve Italian food in honor of Tuscany. <laughs> well, you I was know, gonna say, isn't Tuscany a vacation destination? <laughs> no, no, absolutely. The first year at Hamcation, we were listed as Tusco. T U S C O. So, hey, whatever happened there, I, I went and ragged on them and they fixed it th for the next year, but still, it was like. But see, uh, actually, that's what we're affiliated with the University of Alabama because we're in Tuscaloosa. Uh, <laughs> that reminds me, I haven't uh, went and checked and looked, but uh, do we have a presence at the uh, Ham Exposition coming up? Uh, Ham Expo Northeast. was last weekend. No, that's QSO today that was last week. Oh, well, that's Ham Expo QSA today. Aren't they the same thing? No. Oh. This is the ARRL uh, Northeast Convention that's coming up. Oh, okay. Uh, middle okay. of September. 
Um, yeah, Phil Erickson's giving the keynote at the Grand I know he's Banquet. doing the keynote, right. But uh, do we have any booth presence or anything or talks? Not that I know other than that. Not for Tapper. Okay. Nothing for, or for Hamsai. Except for Phil? Yeah. No, the, all I just know about Phil. Okay. Is he going to have a booth or anything? I don't think so. So he's just going to be he, the keynote. Okay. Yeah. But he does have a team of people making a grape. So there's he has a <laughs> splinter grape group for <laughs> that are going to be able to answer questions and provide him feedback. Are they going to peel it for him? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe he'll make raisins. <laughs> See, the Maybe. problem with ha Ham Expo is that it apparently is used by lots of different people because I just did a Google search and here's one in uh, Belton, Texas that's coming up. I think it's the regional name for them. And Ham Expo, QSO Today Ham Expo, virtual Ham Expo, they use that name. And let's see. The Belton Ham Fest. Here we go. Ham Expo Fall 2021 on ARL. This is probably the one. About yeah, I'm putting it in the, the link in there that is the one we're having. No, this is in Texas, so that's weird. Okay, let me look at the link and see. Uh, M Exposition, no E. I can figure out where the chat room is. Yeah, okay. We're moving it this year from where it had been. Oh, I see. So different. It's also a different time of year. It's supposed to be a different time of year, but. So it's not normally this weekend or this is a new weekend or this. Yeah, this is a different. Well, actually, I'm not sure what it's going to end up because we changed the uh, hotel that it's at. And so <laughs> changed the weekend. But I don't know if this is the original decided weekend. I think it was supposed to be in July and it got moved to September. This doesn't show uh, Phil as the keynote, Nathaniel. Who does it, it show? Should. It shows Bob Interbitson. Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, there's a Friday night and a Saturday night. Oh, okay. Phil's Saturday night. Phil is Bob's Saturday night. No, sorry. It's That's the it's the banquet. So the Saturday a.m. Yeah, okay, got it. Top line on the right, Grand Banquet, Phil Erickson. The Grand Banquet, wow, okay. <laughs> All right, well, let me show you guys the uh, must be gourmet burgers. Yeah. <laughs> Grand burgers. Let's see if I can get this over here out of the way. Too many screens. That's the problem. Okay. So. Let's see. Uh, ah, okay, here we go. Share your screen and there it to be. So this is the board that John made up. And uh, so basically this has the, uh, is the GPS and all the associated circuitry on it. We've already built up another board that has the clock oscillator and the jitter reducer on it that goes in front and in front of this. And then there's the third board, which is the, the uh, uh, Silicon Labs synthesizer chip that goes on the output of the uh, clock board. So this which, three- By the way, is out of stock at DigiKey now. What is? The Silicon Labs chip. Oh, well, that's fine. I already bought mine. Yeah, I know. If you I already have them, that's fine. But I, <laughs> someone brought up that uh, they're hard to find now, dude. Yeah. So the temptation is going to be to sell off all of our parts and make double the money back. And then... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
But so uh, when we get the uh, adapter board for the uh, data and for the RF module, when that's finished, when that gets, hopefully that'll be funded by the ARDC, which we've already asked for grant to build the prototypes. Uh, that will, uh, John will have, the John's going to ship these to me tomorrow. So I'm going to get the rework done. He has a problem is that the GPS has got a bunch of pads underneath it, which looks like like this. So you can see that Ooh. you're not going to be soldering this down with your American beauty. No. <laughs> so it's got to be done with hot air. So we're going to take this over and have it done at our CM. And then uh, so I'll send it back to him along with the uh, eva clock evaluation boards, which I already have assembled from way back. So in a week or so, he'll have everything that he needs to uh, test the clock oscillator chain with the GPS. So basically it'll build up a, a, a haywire GPS DO a, a clock module on three boards. It'll be, you know, that big. And then after that, he's got his brand new toy that he can use to uh, analyze all of the uh, performance of the oscillator. So we actually built up some of the uh, oscillator boards, the clock oscillator boards and bypassed the jitter reducer so we can see how much of an effect the jitter reducer, the linear tech jitter reducer chip actually has on the oscillator output. So be interesting to see if he can actually measure something as esoteric as the jitter reduction from a chip. Anyway, that's all I got here. Very good. So progress is being made in spite of all of the uh, problems we're having with parts. And you're gonna love this, Nathaniel. So we, we put an order in for the uh, the Aria 10 parts for the data engine Mark II. Okay. Just because we have to put an order in, otherwise they can't expedite anything. Right. So we have to be very careful because it's like $15,000 worth of parts. So we have to like uh, watch carefully whether they're going to become available in a time frame after we get funding. Right. Other otherwise we can cancel them. So we don't okay. get stuck for the huge amount or we could just buy them and resell them because <laughs> it's just, they're unobtainium. But I I'm getting like uh, beginning of December delivery date is to start. But Arrow is still messing with us because we changed our, we, we moved our address. We sold our building and moved to home offices a year ago, July 15th. Okay. So that's about uh, 13 months ago. And when we placed the order for the Max 10 parts, they fiddled around for three or four extra weeks saying that, well, they didn't have a change of address in for us. So they couldn't process the order. And the change of address is handled in India and they couldn't get the... Uh, so we're thinking we got that all straightened away. And now we place this order and they say, oh, well, we got your address is wrong. So aye, aye, aye. And I'm going like, you know, I got an answer. I'll buy it from someone else. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, but there really isn't any place that I get the good price from. So I and, and I have some some clout to actually maybe get the parts before the delivery date. So right. I'm, kind of, I'm kind of stuck. And yeah. so we're still fighting with that problem. But wow. I'm hoping that's going to be resolved pretty soon because it's like, come on, really? It's like, yeah. what do you care what my address is? Right. Does it really make any difference? It's like maybe maybe my credit rating goes all to hell because I move. I, I don't know. Right. But we're like, I don't know, uh, Dun and Bradstreet like triple A rating because we've never paid a bill late in the twenty years of our company being in business. Mm -hmm. So. We're very conscientious about that because we we know that if you get a bad credit rating, it's not not good. It's not good. So so anyway, we'll see. But I just wanted to let you know they are in order for December delivery. So maybe we'll be able to maybe Data Engine Mark Two will surpass Data Engine Mark One in the queue. We shall see. We stranger shall see. stranger things have happened. Definitely, stranger things have happened. Stranger things have happened. It would be really cool to have a 10 gig Ethernet port on the board. That's just 
<laughs> then the people who want the full 60 megahertz of spectrum, we can give it to them. That would be really nice. What they're going to do with great. it, that'll be their problem, but yep. you know. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good problem to have. You're gonna have to have a you know, twelve core A nine to be able to run that. Or I guess you could split it into multiple streams and send them to different computers. We could market this thing to the NSA. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, because they've got the process. No, never mind. And we actually <laughs> we worked on a system that had uh, quad forty gig Ethernet ports. And some, I don't even remember anymore, some huge amount of um, flash RAM in it, flash ROM. Now, it was, basically, they were disk drives, but they weren't really disk drives. We built uh, VME sized boards, like three U sized boards that were just covered on both sides with flash memory. And they accepted two or three different SATA commands. So it wasn't a full SATA drive, but it was a kind of a SATA, a poor man's SATA drive, if you will. And we, we arranged the, the flash drives in, a, in 40 banks so that you could do parallel writes to the banks and we could get some god awful throughput through the thing because we were writing 40 banks in parallel. And it, it was a contract for one of those three letter agencies that I don't even remember who it was anymore, but I, if I could remember, I was, I'm not supposed to tell you. <laughs> but, but the idea was we could, we could take 40 gig, four 40 gig channels of data, and we can store like uh, 10 minutes of data at, at 160 gig of throughput. So it actually worked too. That's what's amazing. <laughs> well, it was, it was an experimental type grant that we got, and we weren't even sure that we could do it. And interestingly enough, we used a, uh, an, a Pentium-like chip, and again, I don't even remember the manufacturer of the chip, but the, the month that we decided to use that chip and got in, got our order in, and got our samples ordered was the day that Apple bought the factory. And Apple closed it within a month because all they wanted, they wanted to buy the engineers. They didn't care about the parts. So our, our CPU got discontinued. We built, I think, 20 of them. And then there was no more parts, and it and it was it was worse than just not available. There was never going to be any more parts. That was that part was gone. So we would have had to redesign the board to uh, to, to if they had wanted to buy more of them, but they didn't. And it was amazing too because it was in a eight U high rack or ten U high rack. And I swear the thing would, when the fans took off, it would lift off the desk because <laughs> it required so much cooling. It was almost, we just could almost not do it. It was almost not possible to do it without some active cooling. But we had a, we had the flash boards in the front and the CPU boards in the back. And we had a plenum channel in the middle that we pumped air into. And then it came out both the front and the back. So it was pretty amazing thermal design. To quote Monty Python, it opened the sluices at both ends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what what movie was that from? Or... That's from the uh, uh, Australian Table Wines. Australian Routine. Table Wines. The, they have the ones, the ones Table made? Wines, the drink. Oh. They have a routine about uh, many people poo poo Australian Table Wines. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from the Flying Circus series, right? Yeah, it's on one of the albums. Oh, okay. I don't know if it's a, it must be one of their routines on uh, TV, but I know it from the album. Well, I remember the Australian uh, group where everybody was named Bruce. And then the new guy comes in and he's not named Bruce and it's going to cost. That's right. Because... That's on the, that's, yeah, that's matching tying handkerchief, same album. Yeah. Three sided okay. album. <laughs> Three sided album. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well uh, Jules, I'm glad to hear that you uh, missed the storm or the storm missed you. Uh, interestingly enough, a friend of mine is on vacation in the uh, 
Adirondack area, and he's driving up and down the Taconic Parkway right now, you know, on vacation. And I'm going like, wow, man, you picked the wrong time to go there. Yeah, he's uh, he's driving up and down the Taconic. I'm only about three miles from the, the Taconic at the Harlemville Road exit. Yeah, he's he ate lunch in at, in Chatham. Okay, yeah, so, probably one of the digs I go to. Yeah, yeah. He sent me a photo on the phone because because I that used to be my old stomping ground because I went to Rensselaer so and I lived downstate so I would drive up and down the Conic every time I needed to go home for for the weekend so I mean I could almost recite the exits on the Conic by heart I traveled up and down so many times so I was telling them all the all the uh, cool places to go but I don't know any of the, the cafes or stores or any of that kind of stuff. I just know the the great views, the scenic views. So, when did you graduate from RPI? When? When? 1975. Yeah, a little before my brother then. When did he graduate? I'm trying to think. I graduated from Cornell in 1970, and he was eight years behind me, so he would have been 78. Okay. So you would have been a senior when he was a freshman there. Okay, so we were there at the same time for one year. Yep. Yeah. Buddy, I seem to remember that you grew up on Long Island, not very far from me. Where, where did you live on Long Island? Didn't you I, live on Long Island? I didn't live on Long Island. I lived in Scarsdale. Oh, okay. Okay. It's interesting, though, uh, I found when I was at uh, in one of the chat rooms at uh, the uh, expo, ham radio, well, not the expo, QSO today, whatever it's called, um, a guy asked me why my QSL card was up on eBay. And I go, what? I, what are you talking about? My QSL card's up on eBay. I don't, what do you mean? And, he, and, and so uh, I Googled it. I mean, I, e I went on eBay and looked. Let's see if I... So it turns out this guy apparently got a uh, got hold of an estate from a guy in Pennsylvania who worked me and I sent him a QSL card in 1969 and there oh I have to turn the background off virtual background doesn't work very well okay so this is the card this was sent by me to him in Pennsylvania in 1969 for a field day <laughs> QSO. It was my second field day that I had ever done in 1969. So of course you I had to buy it because where are you going to find one of your own cards that you sent out with a five cent stamp on it? Yeah. <laughs> so I checked and the guy who I sent it to, the guy that I worked, uh, it was a silent key. He died in 2016. He was 100 years old. Whoa. He was born in 1916. He lived to be 100 years old. So it's just interesting. Me alone. Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry. Talking to Old the cats. Don't oh. die. They just go QRT. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but it's interesting because, okay, so here I am in a, in a chat room in the Ham Expo right? Just with the random talking with random people. And, you know, I know one or two of them, but most of them I don't know. And a guy comes up that found my QSL card online. Now, what's the odds of that happening? Uh, first of all, of it being or, or, for sale. Or him remembering your call sign. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, well, I mean, when I get in a chat in a, on a Zoom with you, Dave, I don't go on eBay and type in KV0S. Yeah. <laughs> You know, just to see if I could find a QSL card or something. So it's kind of weird. I mean, but what's well, weird my, is my uh, novice wasn't anything like that call sign. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. So that that field day was, I, and I'm trying to think back to what gear I used, and I think I used a DX60 and an HG10 VFO and a Drake 2B receiver. Because that's the gear I had in 1969. I was a student yeah. in high school. And when I got that 2B, I was just like in heaven because all the other receivers I had before were just junk. They were terrible. Yeah. I didn't even hear any DX until I got the 2B. Yeah, 2B was a great little receiver. Yeah. 
Well, I, I have found that if you're on the air a good deal, you will constantly run into people who you have something in common with. Uh, you know, like you went to the same elementary school or you grew up in the same place. Or, I mean, <laughs> I heard somebody on the air talking about living several places in Queens. And he mentioned all the very same places where I lived before I was five years old, before I moved out of there. And I tried to talk to him, but the band, the, the QS Bravo took him away. So yeah. I, we had a Central Arizona DX Club meeting one, one month years ago. And the presenter, the, whoever was going to give the talk, either was sick or couldn't make it, or so he canceled at the very last minute. So they had to do an impromptu program for the evening. And the program I thought was actually one of the coolest programs I've ever seen. They went around the room and there was like 30 guys. Now they went around the room and they said, how did you get started in ham radio? Tell us a story from how you got started. Tell us about your mentor, about your Elmer, um, you know, where, where did you get your license? What age were you? And I don't know, I'm like that. Well, it turns out amongst the talk, I find out that the guy sitting next to me in the club meeting was born in the same hospital that I was born in, in Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not just the same town, but like the same hospital too. So, I mean, and you know, you don't usually walk up to somebody and say, well, what hospital were you born in? You know, so you, how it gets around to that question, I have no idea. But like that guy on the air, I, I mean, how he wasn't talking to you, but yet you still heard like three areas that you lived in. So very strange how you come up with, how you find out that they have things in common. That's the, that's the weird part. I don't think it's so weird that they have, think people have things in common. I think it's how you find out that they do. It, it, it makes case, you wonder what we have in common and don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, in this case, he was talking to somebody else and I was just copying the mail and I thought, man, that's interesting. I mean, you talk to this guy, but then, the band changed and yeah yeah changed. well i need to go so i'm going to say 73 yeah i think i am too calling it an early night unless there's anything that... i'm going to go Q qrt here no, same here going qrt here i'll stop it but scotty before you go i promise to show you something